Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar sponsored by Teladoc. Telehealth industry experts answer top questions from C-level health system executives. I'm Max Green, writer and reporter with Becker's Healthcare. Today's webinar includes questions that were obtained through a survey earlier this month from C-level executives as their top questions surrounding telehealth. Additionally, we reserve time near the end of the webinar to answer additional questions you may have. You can submit questions throughout the presentation by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled Enter a Question for Staff and clicking Send. Our panelists will attempt to, attempt to answer as many questions as possible during this time. Following the webinar, you'll receive a copy of the sur uh, you'll receive a survey to complete about the webinar. We value your feedback as it will help guide future webinar topics. Additionally, you'll receive an email with, within a few days after the webinar that will include instructions on how you can view the presentation and share with your colleagues. And on to the webinar itself. Telehealth is one of the fastest growing solutions being implemented across major health systems today. As interest in telehealth gains steam, healthcare organizations are trying to keep pace to provide this type of affordable and accessible care to patients and their communities. Through, though the number of virtual visit programs is quickly increasing, Integrating telehealth into practice is still a relatively new process for many organizations. In today's webinar, we have three telehealth experts who will answer a variety of questions submitted by health system executives earlier this month from a survey around integrating telehealth into care delivery. It's now my pleasure to introduce you to today's three telehealth panel experts. Dr. Judd E. Hollander is Associate Dean for Strategic Health Initiatives at Sydney Kimmel Medical College at Thomas Jefferson University and Professor and Vice Chair of Finance and Healthcare Enterprises and Emergency Medicine, where responsibilities include the Jeff Connect Telemedicine Program and Jefferson Urgent Care. His clinical and academic interests focus on efficient healthcare delivery, including rapid diagnostic testing and risk stratification of patients with acute care conditions. Dr. Hollander has published over 400 peer-reviewed articles, chapters, and editorials, is a past president of the Society for Academic Emergency Medicine, and deputy editor for the Annals of Emergency Medicine. Dr. Hollander was awarded the ACEP Award for Outstanding Research in 2001, the Hal Jane SAEM Academic Excellence Award in 2003, and the SAEM Leadership Award in 2011. Next, Thomas Hetherington is a strategy executive with a legacy of leading innovation and large-scale business change across the health industry. His experience extends to all segments of the health industry, including commercial payers, provider, government health entities, and life science organizations in the United States, Canada, Germany, France, and Russia. His specific areas of expertise include innovation, wellness and prevention, disease management, provider network management, clinical reengineering, and customer relationship management. Dr. Alan Roga is Senior Vice President and General Manager of the Provider Market for Teladoc where he has a full P&L responsibility for the strategic direction and management of Teladoc services offered to hospitals, health systems, retail clinics, and physician groups. Prior to Teladoc, Dr. Roga was the founder and CEO of Stat Doctors, a national e-healthcare company that he led from startup to acquisition by Teladoc. He is a board-certified emergency physician and has served as president of Scottsdale Emergency, emergency Associates Limited <clears throat> and chairman of the Emergency Department of Honor Health. Again, we encourage you to interact throughout the event by submitting questions. We'll also be live tweeting during the event if you'd like to join the conversation at the hashtag TalkTelehealth. I'll now pass over the facilitation of the web webinar to Lena Vivian, Senior Marketing Manager with Teladoc Provider Market. Thank you, Max. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Let's get started with our first question. What are the main drivers of telehealth? Tom, if you'd like to take the lead on this one. Sure. So broadly speaking, the primary drivers are economic. Whereas the first wave of telehealth focused on access-related use cases, as telehealth matures, this focus is shifting to improving continuity of care, improving transitions of care, and reducing labor intensity in the system, both in situations where telehealth can help address labor shortages and in situations where telehealth can lower costs. I expect another driver for telehealth is the strategic nature of this capability, especially as competition heats up among providers. In this regard, improving patient outcomes and satisfaction will become a more important driver. Thank you, Tom. Judd, would you like to add? Yeah, I, I would agree with everything that Tom said. The only thing that I might like to add is that I think patients demand the kind of access for everything. It's not just medicine. Right, all day, every day, people are on their smartphones, 
whether it's ordering Uber or some other you know, way to travel somewhere or a product from an online company, basically the only thing you can't do might actually be the most important thing. You generally can't get your health care on your smartphone. And I think the, you know, the new generation, the millennials, really the people less than 40, 45 years old, at this point are used to using their smartphone for everything. And I think they want to use it for medicine. And so that's what we're seeing. There really is not a compelling reason to come downtown Philadelphia where I practice, drive through traffic, pay for parking, wait to see your physician when you could do it from the comfort of your home or from work. So I think patients are increasingly demanding more convenient care and telehealth is one way to provide it. Good point, Alan. Yeah, in addition to the comments around really market demand and the financial implications, I think there's been a lot of legislative pressure to look for more cost-effective solutions. It really started along with the you know, Affordable Care Act and really shifting pay, payment models, uh, which has driven a lot of the need of the industry to develop cost-effective solutions. Uh, but in addition to the comments around you know, today's consumer really having cost and access to care being their primary drivers, I'd add a, a, a fourth item to this, which is really, I think, the success of the industry is now driving uh, additional growth of the industry. So in the modern day, telehealth industry has been around since approximately 2005. Um, as now there is enough body of evidence to show great results, um, you're starting to see more and more attraction. So even you know, at Teladoc, we've done over a million and a half uh, um, uh, telehealth consults. Um, and approximately have done about two-thirds of the market for it. But you've, the questions early on were, you know, is telehealth safe? Can it be effective? And all these kind of things. And now there's enough body of evidence to show patients have a phenomenal experience, 95% satisfaction, you know, 96% physician satisfaction. On the financial side, demonstrable cost savings. Uh, and then on the safety side, you know, we've experienced no malpractice claims, antibiotic dosing in line with EDIS measures, um, decreased needs for follow-up appointments. So while there's enough body now to show great traction, we're really at the tip of the iceberg of a very large addressable market. Thank you, Alan. Our next question, what are the biggest challenges in telehealth? Judge, would you like to lead this one? Sure, I'll be happy to take a stab at it. I, the, the biggest challenges are, are plentiful, and they, I think, largely focus on legal and regulatory challenges. And, and I'm not going to say what I refer to as a four-letter word, even though it's reimbursement. But ironically, the thing that's slowing down telehealth adoption is that we haven't been able to prove on a population level that it actually improves costs. There's very good data and very sound logic that if you do a $50 telehealth visit, it's a heck of a lot cheaper than a $1,000 emergency department or $150 urgent care or a $100 primary care visit. And, and no one argues with those numbers. But, but I had the, you know, the, the extreme honor of going down and meeting with 10 people in Congress and the Senate a week or two ago. And, and they were largely people that were interested in sponsoring the Connect for Health bill that's sitting there. And we all know that in healthcare, if Medicare plays ball, everybody else plays ball. But the Congressional Budget Office requires, before they can sign off on telehealth going forward, they actually require a demonstration that it's not going to drive up costs. And so at the Congressional level and in the, in the CBO, they're worried that everybody who doesn't go to a doctor now is going to find it so convenient to see their doctor over video that in fact the cost of medicine are going to go up and with generally the escalating cost of medicine they can't afford it and, and so we we tend to think of things at the individual level and sure we save money the question is at the population level are we going to save money but the connect for health bill that's there is going to be a big step forward for all of us and there's two other points that i think have really hurt us on the legal and regulatory end of it one is there's a lot of discussion about providing rural telehealth. And I think that's really important. But people need to understand that the ability to get care should not be related to geography. It should be access rather than geography that rules the day. And I like to say that within a mile of my hospital in downtown Philadelphia, I have more people who don't have access to care than whole counties in rural states. And we need to be able to take care of everything. And then the final thing that I think 
is impeding some of the regulatory concerns, is confusion over care coordination. Everybody thinks it's really important to coordinate care, but they haven't been able to articulate that in a manner that makes sense. And what they often say is telehealth can be done by somebody who has an established patient relationship. But if you think about that, an established patient relationship counts in many state regulations as the on-call doctor covering for somebody else, even though that on-call doctor may be at dinner, may be in the theater, and has no access to the electronic medical records. Yet an emergency physician, and I'm biased, I'm an emergency physician, but an emergency physician who's in a dedicated booth looking at the medical records can probably better coordinate care than a doctor who happens to be in the same practice but has never met the patient if they don't have access to the EMR. So I think the care coordination is important, but we have to find precise language to enable people to coordinate care regardless of whether they're from the same practice as the primary care physician. Thank you, Dr. Alan. Anything to add? Yes, and I think those were great points. I often think that uh, in addition to, you know, the great drivers that we've discussed, those are also at the same level the challenges. So, you know, the drivers being around market demand, uh, financial uh, need for reform, and then legislative issues are really the same three challenges that the industry is dealing with um, as it evolves. You know, on the adoption of the service, which, and by the way, all three of these are headed in a positive direction. Um, there have been great strides there. But if you look at, for example, market adoption, you have an industry that has generally low barriers to entry, but there's extraordinary high barriers to scale and success. You know, today, if you're sick, you're trained to go to the doctor's office. But now what telehealth does is meet the consumer and the patient where they want to be met, to judge point around access to care, and people are open to virtual care but it requires constant education to get them to understand and change behaviors. And once they use it, then there's incredible satisfaction and people tend to use it again with high recidivism rate. So market adoption um, requires constant attention. And you know, from our experience, we've really learned that the messaging and developing the 14 different personas and how do you get targeted marketing and materials available to different users might 15-year-old daughter who's on social media all day long interacts differently than my 81-year-old mother. So and then my, you know, then my wife who's chasing four children. So understanding the needs of, you know, today's patient and consumer is really critical. On the financial side, I think it's becoming um, less of an issue as the industry started with more contained pools, and now you're seeing, you know, 29 states have parity laws. And it's a just point. You're going to start seeing the federal government getting your arms around what's going to get reimbursed or not, which will drive a lot of it. And then on the legislative side of the regulatory slide side, while early on there were you know, lots of concerns that you know, medical boards weren't exactly sure what to do and how, how the technology had really surpassed the guidelines, in the last 18 months we've seen 21 states pass positive changes. Um, now sort of the regulatory items are limited to just a few focal states. So uh, overall, you're seeing that market and, and that segment of the challenges significantly improve. Thank you, Alan. Tom, would you please add to this question? Yeah, a lot of great points. The only thing I'd add is uh, it's interesting to consider that in some ways, telehealth challenges long-standing norms for how we think about medicine. So meaning the geographically centric legacy model of care delivery. So one major challenge is culture change, especially in organizations that are sponsoring telehealth solutions, which would which really require strong leadership and change management skills. Uh, maybe one more point which links to understanding consumer needs, what Alan mentioned, and then also related to care coordination is just that telehealth, telehealth interactions are occurring at a time when our industry is moving in more of a retail direction. So it just is coincidentally occurring when a lot more interactions at the consumer level are occurring from a marketing standpoint, a service standpoint. Consumers are taking a lot more uh, control of their health and their health decisions. So thinking about how these telehealth interactions uh, are a part of uh, a new generation of health products. And, and what that means. So I think the challenge is 
is just uh, integrating telehealth interactions with other consumer facing uh, uh, and product related interactions. Agree. Thank you, Tom. On to our next question. What do you see as the top use cases for telehealth? Alan, if you'll take the lead. Sure. And, um, you know, specific to the provider market and really a lot of the audience on the line, we, we spent a lot of time on this. I, I really look at uh, what I find is a lot of systems jump to a use case right away without necessarily defining the organizational strategy. Um, because really what you're doing by implementing a telehealth program is you're developing a strategic asset that is going to touch numerous service lines within the provider system. Um, and defining those early on helps drive the use cases. You know, at a high level, I think there are three strategic buckets of value creation around finance, care coordination, and then really a growth opportunity. And each of these drive multiple use cases, and they have different value creation. So on the finance side, um, telehealth applied to a population at risk. So whether for it's a provider organization for their own employees, as they're typically very large employers in their area, or population health program, an accountable care organization, or cap risk with an insurance plan, wherever there's financial risk for a population, you know, telehealth provides value there. The next one around care coordination really is where systems are looking at increasing access to their providers, looping in specialty care that may or may not be readily available and coordinating all that information into their EHR is important. And then the last one's really around a growth strategy. So systems will often look at a use case for a direct-to-consumer program where they're trying to acquire net new patients or have stickiness of their existing patient to prevent leakage um, or as well to uh, encroach into a competitor's marketplace in a more cost-effective way than building a bricks-and-mortar location. Um, and all of these have different value drivers. So on the finance side, it's around cost efficiency, and you've got an ROI, three, five, seven, nine times ROI when applied to a defined population. On the care coordination aspect, I think most systems are looking this at the cost of doing business. You know, you have a CAT scan, you have an MRI, you have an outpatient surgery center and you have a telehealth platform to expand care outside of the four walls. And the value creation is really around an efficiency and access to care model. And then the growth strategy is ultimately a long-term investment and the values around increased market share and customer acquisition uh, to the lifetime value of that patient being in the system. So, you know, with those as sort of overarching use cases, the top use case that I, I still think is the most powerful right now is the financial one. It's the most quantifiable. Um, it's where the industry has the most experience. You know, we've commissioned the Teladoc uh, external study of Harvard economists that found $673 of savings uh, in a defined population for very large employer groups uh, that we're able to deflect them in a statistically significant slope change. So, um, you know, cost deflection to a financial pool is key. Um, we've applied these principles to ACOs, hospitals that have had full risk with capitated populations, um, payment bundles. So, you know, I, I still like that use case. Not to say that a care coordinates aspect for access to care isn't critical or, you know, increasing market share. But to me, that one is still the most quantifiable and, and probably the top use case that I see. Thank you, Alan. Tom, if you would like to add? Just... Uh, great context setting, just some specific example use cases. Uh, one would be care at home. So anything that allows uh, individuals to remain in their home and uh, live safely and, and receive the care that they need and not have to uh, you know, leave their home and, and use more expensive resources to the system. So, uh, you know, this becomes very obvious when you think of things like post-discharge care, post-discharge management. So things that are directly sponsored by as an extension of the integrated delivery system or the provider. Uh, but it's also uh, what's more interesting to me is when you think the consumer side of this. So think of it as a benefit package or packages of benefits that allow individuals to care for their, uh, their sick children or their, their aging parents uh, or some other loved one in their home uh, and, and do this uh, safely and, and inexpensively. So I think care at home is one. 
Uh, the next would be uh, more of a category, what I'll call the new generation of health and wellness products that have an integrated telehealth component. And so there's both a B2C examples of this and, and B2B as well. But uh, instead of, and, and Alan alluded to this as well, instead of independent standalone use cases, uh, so integrating telehealth in a way that uh, really delivers a complete holistic health experience or health intention. So, uh, you know, once again, this becomes obvious when you think about it from the consumer side, the patient side, uh, but it's also important for, for providers and those in the care system to allow them to do business, uh, business easier, less expensively, think of the rounding, uh, rounding provider, rounding physician, et cetera. So uh, I think most of the examples we've seen today are standalone use cases. Uh, we haven't seen this integrated, these integrated solutions that are, uh, uh, just to, to draw it out, when I say standalone use cases, I mean, for example, a disease management solution, uh, or just think of Fitbits and scales and blood pressure cups, and, and they're, they're all very compelling. I, I hear a little bit of uh, echo back. But, but we haven't seen pervasive this, Integrating them all into a in, into a uh, health experience. Thank you, Tom. Jed. Yeah. So I I think the the last two speakers have done a great job in covering things. I, I I'm going to just add you, you know one really quick point and then give you an example. And I think Alan nailed it on its head when he said it has to fit into the main institutional strategy. Telemedicine isn't a game. Telemedicine isn't a toy. It's a way to deliver care to patients. And if your institution really wants to do that, you need to come up with an institutional strategy. And a one-off program, Telederm, might be perfectly good, but that's a dermatology strategy and not an institutional strategy. And then only people who've already seen your dermatologist or may need to see a dermatologist know that exists. So we at Jefferson have really taken a big look from the top down in developing an institutional strategy, recognizing and firmly believing, as probably most of you do, that we're moving from a fee-for-service to a value-based care system. And what I mean from that at its simplest level, and this sounds so silly, right now health systems make money by doing unindicated back surgery. In three years, they're going to lose money by doing unnecessary back surgery. So those high revenue producers now will actually be high costs later. And so we've tried to develop a strategy that would work for patients throughout their life cycle. And if you can imagine for a minute, I wish I'd put this in the slide, I apologize, that you're looking at a clock and you begin by thinking of the patient at six o'clock at the bottom of this as somebody who's at their baseline what happens when patients are no longer at their baseline or no well, longer well is they get a little sick and if they don't get better, a little more sick. And at 12 o'clock in our model, we actually have the emergency department. And now a lot of the world has focused on cost containment when patients hit the emergency department, right? Put them in observation, avoid the 30-day readmissions. But no matter what you do, about a quarter of the patients who show up in the emergency department are sick enough they need to be admitted and they move through the right cycle of this clock, maybe at one or two o'clock, and, and then most of them, fortunately, we do a good job and they get better and go home. And, and so envisioning the, the cycle of a patient's acute illness like that, we've built in programs around the clock. So at one o'clock, when patients might be in the emergency department or getting admitted to the inpatient setting, we have a 32 hospital neurostroke network where our neurovascular specialists do consultation, like most other neurostroke networks, and, and do a real nice job. When patients are in the hospital in the acute care setting, we've built out a program called Virtual Rounds, where we will dial in or video conference in the patient's family so they could be in the room at whatever time the doctors round and take part of care, but yet still go to work. Or maybe if it's a referral 50 miles away, they don't need to drive in just to see the doctor. At the bottom of the clock, where people are going through the transition of care phase, or they're well, or they're becoming a little sick, we've trained 400 providers at our institution in every specialty to do outpatient scheduled video visits. And we've done a whole bunch of them over the last six months. 
For the patients who can't see their regular doctor, we have a direct-to-consumer product, Jeff Connect, where you download the app on your smartphone, and you can get an ER doc 24-7, 365, who's devoted to nothing else at the time besides seeing you. And, and so we have really taken a very big institutional-wide perspective and said, let's make telemedicine an option for anybody who wants to do it, whether they're sick, whether they're well, whether they're in the emergency department, whether they're in the acute care setting. And what we're finding is once patients use it in one of those settings, they'll use it in other ones of those settings. And like Tom and Alan said, then we are able to improve patient convenience and dial down the cost curve a little bit. Thank you, Jed. Our next question, what skill sets or training are needed for face-to-face -face versus virtual care? Jed, would you like to take the lead since you have a lot of experience here? Oh, you're never gonna let me shut up now. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, I'm ha so this is really interesting. For those of you that haven't done you, you know, video care, it, it, like I said, I'm an emergency physician. You have to be able to live with a little bit of uncertainty because no matter what people say, it's not exactly the same as a face-to-face -face in the office visit. That doesn't mean you can't get to the right answer virtually all the time, but you need to know when you can get enough information that you are at the right answer or when you need to say, okay, you do actually need a real face-to-face -face visit rather than a video visit. And, and specifically, it's interesting, I find it's a little bit like wilderness medicine. And I'll give you two examples. One is we saw somebody who was in a large store, let's call it Staples, who had prior, had prior MCL surgery, which for those of you who are in practicing medicine is knee surgery, and he hurt his knee again. And so now how am I gonna do a great knee exam with this gentleman in the back room of the store? It turns out he had an associate who knew enough medicine that he was comfortable coming in the room and I walked the associate through a knee exam for him. And the gentleman needed his knee splinted, but he didn't need an x-ray. And guess what, it's Staples. They have yardsticks and someone there had an ACE bandage and we were able to wrap his knee and rather than send him to an emergency department at 5.15 in the afternoon, we were able to send him to an orthopedist that he already had the next day and he was splinted and safe. So I think you know the main thing you need to have is some creativity and, and the ability to realize you can't do it the way you used to do it. But when faced with taking care of patients, if you just keep in mind you're gonna do what's right for the patient, you can find up with creative ways to help the patient. Otherwise you have to send them someplace for face-to-face, -face, which is just totally fine. Thank you, Jeff. Alan? Yeah, I, I think those are great insights, and and you know I'm also in your opposition like Judd, um, and having sort of been in this space now for about seven years, I've seen it evolve. I think one of the, you know, one of the sort of concerns early on are what are the computer and technical requirements and things like that, and and actually they're quite minimal. Um, I think what it comes down to is a lot of what Judd articulated, which is. Uh, I do believe that this is becoming a new specialty or subspecialty. It's the era of the virtualist, and we need to treat it as such. You know, being an ER doc 30 years ago, you'd have whatever intern was just off their rotation working in the ER taking care of people, and we found that the people were actually not being served the right way. And so it became a real specialty with real science behind it and training behind it, and it's evolved into really the gateway for modern healthcare, for people to access their care now. And I, I think this industry is following the same sort of evolutionary dynamics of the ER, you know, the intensivist has been born in my time, the, the critical care specialist, the hospitalist, and I do think you're seeing the virtualist. And I think it's important to really set up everybody for success, um, and that comes through processes with whether it's a Teldoc or Jefferson, where you've got you know, board involvement, governance, quality controls, protocols, and guidelines. These things are really key, rather than just saying, well, you know, let me throw someone on the computer and they can video chat with a patient. I, I think setting up with a structure, process, QA, oversight, very key for this industry and the specialty to really enhance and involve. And then from a practical standpoint, what I've seen is um, we had to retrain a lot of our physicians early on to slow down. Um, they had to develop, redevelop their history-taking skills. 
because it's not just jumping to test ordering a physical exam. It's really slowing down, listening to the patient, speaking slowly, looking at the camera instead of at the screen, or making sure the camera's set up right so the eyes are focused on the patient, uh, and appropriate decor and location, of course, so that you're not doing these visits in the middle of a crowded Starbucks and exposing all the information as it shouldn't be. Again, it needs to be treated as a dedicated visit with appropriate guidelines, education, protocols, policies, procedures, and then I think you have a very successful program. Thank you, Alan. Tom? Hey, yes, uh, just really uh, leveraging off what Alan just mentioned, extended, say, customer service training. So similar to the, the type of training that would be delivered by the, the world's best consumer-facing companies, what they would give to their customer service representatives. So. Uh, very great listening skills, active listening, uh, understanding of uh, satisfaction, voice tones, etc. So that would be one. Uh, the next would be an understanding of human behavior and, and human behavior change. So this includes being able to assess where a patient is in terms of their capability of managing their their situation, their ability to do this, as well as how incentives how incented they are to do what's required on their end. Uh, and then finally, I'd say an understanding of the broader care network, including how to leverage community-based resources and, uh, and, and their extended care network within their family. Uh, so those would, be, those would be three. Thank you, Tom. Our next question, what type of professionals are needed to implement a program? Alan, do I take it away? Sure. So um, at a high level, there are really three things that you need to do to run a successful t telehealth program. You have to market and engage the member, the patient, the consumer. You have to have technology that provides a strong user experience. And then you have to have a physician strategy of you know, how you're going to actually provide care. And all of these, by the way, require operational support needs um, and back to you know, where we were before, which is, to me, it's defined the strategy and the use case, and that defines your implementation needs. You, you know, you have a system like Judd that's obviously doing a very robust telehealth program at Jefferson with different resource needs, but, you know, overall, uh, some solutions can be quite modest early on, sort of a crawl, walk, run phenomenon. I find a lot of systems want to start in telehealth, but they're really not sure how to start, where to start. Um, and it's a multi-year strategy. You know, year one, I'm sorry, it's a little bit background on one of the lines. Um, probably year one, the simplest way is, you know, you can start with whether it's an employee population or an accountable care organization. You know, you expand from there into readmission programs. You can start with a retail strategy, add in some specialty care and driving visits into clinics, um, and integrating your systems, expanding care to the access of providers, adding in some specialty care. So, I, again, these are multi-year strategies that you don't have to bite off everything at once. You know, what we found is uh, we offer services from really where the systems will outsource um, uh, to us as a co-branded solution, all the way to providing them a very robust platform as a service. And, and I think it's important for systems to decide what's the right size of where they want to start. Either way, it's not overly complicated. I mean, you're looking at implementation needs, you know, 45 to 60 days, and there's some key questions for systems to ask, like, is it important to, um, is it just a video solution for existing patients that are established with their providers, um, or is it important to really have patients you may or may not know with doctors they may or may not know? For for many systems, what we find is, you know, starting simply with, you know, perhaps a direct consumer offering or an employee offering as an outsource solution is the right size. You can also apply that to an accountable care organization. When you start there, implementation needs and requirements are very small. Um, there's a uh, integration person, so someone to do uh, data file exchanges and marketing sign-off, but uh, a busy hospital executive or team can go on doing their daily needs, as opposed to, you know, platform as a service is much more involved. 
you know, this is looking for a system that really wants to build a telehealth program, a lot like what Judd is talking about, and they're doing at Jefferson. And this is where you have a private label, dedicated instance. I, I find a lot of systems now are hiring a formal director of telehealth to organize all of the activities. And then you're looking at, you know, someone clinical that's involved in training and troubleshooting. You need some operations people to do, you know, data transfers and do business intelligence around reports, manage physicians. Um, and I would also add just in closing that I, I, I would not underestimate the operational support needs. Um, I find a lot of systems think that this is primarily you know, a video platform solution, uh, and it's not. All of these strategies do evolve, involve putting support around them. So, again, you're building a strategic asset that's touching service lines, you know, either treated as such or, I think, outsourcing for sort of initial steps in a smaller fashion is the right thing for a lot of systems. Thank you, Alan. Tom, would you like to add? Sure, thank you. Uh, I would add just specifically, because Alan kind of covered the full gamut, just change management services. So in line, once again, with my earlier comments, but understanding all the stakeholders and how their rules will be impacted, uh, having a solid internal and external communication plan, a good training program again, which we talked about a minute ago with customer service, but particularly for caregivers and associates that are interacting with patients and their families. Uh, the other thing, once again, what Alan mentioned, crawl, walk, run. So I'd say professionals that understand how to deploy new capabilities and stages. In some cases, an organization will deploy telehealth in a pilot, and it's important to learn quickly and then scale with confidence. Uh, so keep in mind that, once again, in some cases, the organization may change the underlying solution quite, quite meaningfully. Uh, based on the results of the pilot. So you have to be able to make those changes and build them into a plan so you can still scale with confidence. Thank you, Tom. Judd? Judd? Yeah, I think I would just add, and I, I'm not sure I'm really adding as much as supporting the comments of, of Alan and Tom, but I think it's really critical for people that are beginning to understand that this is about operations and leadership. It's not actually about the technology. The technology can hurt your program, but it, but it can't actually create your program. The creation of the program is having the right team of people together to utilize the technology to solve the problem that you have. At, at my shop, I'm fortunate that we have a team of people who have an ability to implement, but most importantly, we have phenomenal support from senior leadership. As I go around the country and view other programs and hear what other people are doing, too often I hear about a really neat, unique telemedicine program that was stood up on grant funding, and the day the grant funding expired, so did the program, because they never developed the implement implementation team, and they never actually got the support of senior leadership to make things happen. So I think the success of these programs is about people, people, and more people. And to illustrate that point, we got a little lucky when we hired our first program manager we debated whether we needed somebody who was a technophile or we needed somebody who was a people person. And we went with a people person. And I think a lot of the success for our program is having people work with you who can work with others and scale the program. Thank you, Jed. Our next question. How do you see telehealth evolving over the next 10 years? Tom, would you like to take the lead? Sure, recognizing that 10 years is a long time, but uh, in line with uh, my actually introductory comments to the, the first question, uh, I see telehealth moving from an important operating capability uh, to a critical strategic capability in a, an increasingly competitive environment. So uh, I expect telehealth will become integrated in the way that provides the host organizations a competitive edge. So telehealth has become a, a, a key differentiator, a distinguishing feature for future health products across our industry sectors. So you see this today in pockets. So as an example, some health plans bundle teledoc products into their core health insurance products as a source of differentiation, but I expect to see much more pervasive examples. An analog might be, if you, if you think about the way the Internet of Things, IoT, uh, if you think about that with consumer products. So almost 
everything is connected to the internet. And if a consumer product doesn't have the ability to connect to the internet, in many cases it isn't competitive. So in the next 10 years, uh, I think telehealth will play the same differentiation role for, for many of our health products. Thank you. Judd? Yeah, I think that uh, Tom makes a really good point. 10 years is a really long time. But m my guess is 10 years from now, we will never hear the word telehealth again. It will just be health. It will be everywhere. Everybody will be doing telehealth because I think if you're not doing video calls and you're not using this technology 10 years from now, you're not going to be providing care to any patients 10 years from now because very few patients will want to get all of their care in the least convenient manner in which physicians and providers can render it. Good point. Alan? Yeah, I think that my, uh, my, my colleagues have made great points, and that, you know, I, I, I like Tom's point a lot about uh, evolving from you know, specific use cases to a strategy as an organization, because I'm a big believer in that. I guess at a tactical level, I won't try to look at 10 years, but and maybe I'll try to give you three to five um, as, as you know, been in this space for a while now. I, I think that really what you're going to see is um, advancement in specialty care, data integration, and longitudinal care. So, so maybe at the risk of repeating what's been said already, I'll go to a tactical level. Um, I, I think on the specialty side, you know, general medical care is being delivered fairly effectively for minor illnesses. Uh, and now you're seeing doctors connecting with their patients and adding in, you know, referral care. But I think discrete areas like uh, behavioral health, dermatology, areas where, you know, frankly, we saw a need um, with adding the largest population base in, in, you know, between employers and payers and hospitals that we serve, you know, there's really this market for a tremendous demand for behavioral health, and, and it's gone very, very well um, because there's, a, there's an, an access issue for behavioral health as well. So what we're seeing is, you know, an integration of additional specialties into a singular platform, which is really our vision of how we're delivering care, as opposed to, I think, what Judd articulated, which is, you know, just the telehealth, just a DERM program or just the BH program. Uh, on the data side, I think that one is, really matters a lot as well. Um, you know, there's a, a lot of questions around EHRs, and you're seeing hospitals making major investments in them. And I think on the data side right now, and, you know, the hospital CMIO has just asked for hundreds of millions of dollars for their major vendor implementation, so they want to make sure everything is documented in the EHR. I think that's a three-phase approach you'll see in the next few years. Right now, you know, it, it's can you get the data in? then can you consume it, and then can you make it actionable? I, I think we're pretty much at stage one, stage two. You know, the data can get into the EHR. You know, now can you get into a deeper bi-directional feed with the sweet elements? That's starting now. And then really, as systems are developing their own population health uh, management tools, you know, they want to export that into their own analysis. Uh, and I, I think you'll see an evolution now into more complex and longitudinal care. You're already seeing it with subspecialty enhancements, but um, remote devices, biometrics, you know, as chronic management starts to get into what was an acute care-focused industry early on, I, I think those are sort of the next rocks you'll see moved over this short period of time. But I agree with these guys. I mean, you know, I've been in it for seven years, and it's, it's almost like dog years. You know, they, they, it advances so quickly. Um, it, it, the rate of change is incredible. So, yeah, 10 years is a, is a long time for an industry like this. Thank you. And this brings us to one of our last questions, and then we'll get to our questions from our audience. Um, while telehealth provides enormous benefits for both payer and patient, what do you consider to be the key advantages that it brings to providers? Judd, do you want to take the lead on this one? Yeah, so I, I think it's interesting. I think the key advantage it brings to providers is a patient-centered advantage. I think right now it gives providers the advantage to be a step ahead, a step ahead of other providers and, and grow access. This is a question that comes up with respect to costs when payers are concerned 
that every provider is now going to be seeing a gazillion more patients now that telehealth and telemedicine is available. And, and the truth of the matter is providers are only going to work the number of hours in a day that a provider wants to work. So what telemedicine does is it lets a provider swap one way of seeing a patient, i.e. in person, for another way of seeing a patient, i.e. via video chat. And in that manner, it lets providers give more patient-centered care. So I actually think the main advantage to a provider is that it lets patients deliver care, it lets providers deliver care to patients in the manner that patients would want to have it. I don't foresee a day where providers are gonna to wanna to be having video chats with their patients around the clock. I think you know providers work the hours they work, but it does give us a great, great ability to be much more patient-centered. And those providers that don't wanna be patient-centered, I think you'll see fade to the background over the next four or five years. Thank you. Alan? Yeah, I think uh, you know one of the main advantages that I would add for providers, and I think what it really does is help them providers grow their business and their brand at scale. So, um, you know, Traditional bricks and mortar is not being replaced. However, you know, telehealth it provides an opportunity to operationalize and scale a lot of these opportunities and allows the provider organization really uh, of being responsible in, in being able to take care of the patients in their community and provide them access to care in, in a really a confident fashion and in a, in a sound delivery model. So, you know, at a high level, it's about growing brand and business at, at scaling in a scalable operation. The other thing I would add as well is I think that if a provider organization is looking at this as, you know, simply a video solution, then that's limiting the benefits there. So if, if all anybody wants to do is, you know, establish patients with doctors that they've already seen for 30 years uh, and do video software, you know, that could be Skype. FaceTime, any sort of video conference solution. But the magic, I think, of what telehealth does is allows patients who may or may not know their physicians with doctors who may or may not know them to connect in a sophisticated manner through a queuing and routing system that allows organizations to be scalable. That's, that's really the magic of what these platforms do. Um, the last thing I think that's often overlooked is the, the physicians have great uh, advantages for them. I know we're, we're thinking providers as hospitals, but at the physician level, you have tremendous satisfaction. 96% of physicians are very satisfied who practice virtual care uh, in our program. You know, there are doctors who, uh, this is providing alternative lifestyle for them. I mean, they want to stay home if they have young children or, you know, nearing retirement age or may have disabilities that preclude them from running around a busy office practice. This is allowing a scarce resource to actually have a different lifestyle that, that suits their needs through telehealth. So I, I think that, you know, it's a small but a very important point I think worth making. Thank you, Alan. Tom, would you like to add? Sure. Uh, so just in line with uh, what Alan was just mentioning, uh, I think many providers really like every sector in health are working through ways to extend their leadership position. This includes new types of products and services, many moving into care management, many looking for ways to sell services to other providers, as well as to sell services to others in the health industry, payers, pharmaceuticals, and outside of the health industry, selling services to retailers. So telehealth is an important part of these strategies. So creating new options for providers to extend the impact of their brand more broadly. So some think of it as diversification, but it's broader than that. It's really the impact of the brand. Thank you. Well, we've received some questions, and we have, still have a few minutes to answer. Um, let's go to what are the top considerations for a system when developing a telehealth program? Judd, would you like to take the lead? So oh, I, I think it comes down to the top considerations depend on the strategy. And so I think the system has to decide what the system wants out of it. And so what we decided to do when we grew our program is we went around and spoke to everybody. And functionally, I mean pretty close to everybody. We had representatives who were on the leadership of each department. 
we had patients, we had people who worked at the institution, you know, who weren't in leadership roles, and we had people who were providers and people who were not providers. And, and we asked one simple question to open the door to the conversation. What are your biggest problems that prevent you from taking optimal care of your patient or from getting optimal care? And, and we listened to people, and then after they had, you know, spilled their beans and put their gripes on the table, we said, which of these things can you imagine we might be able to solve with telemedicine or something like Skype or FaceTime? And we developed a list of several hundred things. And, and then we coalesced around those things, effectively putting stickies on the wall and seeing what things come together and, and created our program. So you might imagine as one example that what we call a scheduled visit might actually be a scheduled visit for behavioral health, might be for student counseling, might be for dermatology, might actually be post-op for somebody, and, and might actually be post-discharge from somebody else. But operationally, they're all the same thing. We need to figure out how to get that patient scheduled, how to get that provider trained, and how to connect the two of them to go forward. So I think my answer to the person who asked this question is you have to figure out what your major problems are and then which of them can you solve through telemedicine and, and then go about it in a thoughtful way to see how many of those problems you could pluck off in one, two, three, four, or five use cases, depending on how much financial support and manpower support you have to grow your program. Thank you, Jen. In the interest of time, I'd like to get to a couple other questions. Uh, we've had lots of questions around regulatory uh, physician licensing. Alan, would you like to speak to this topic? Sure. Um, so overall, the regulatory environment is significantly improved in telehealth, and, and any discussion around telehealth would not be complete without discussing the regulatory aspect of it. I, I think if you look at the history of it, it'll answer a lot of what the current state is, which is, you know, um, the medical boards typically govern licensure on a state-specific level over physician licenses. So they don't necessarily opine on business models. And uh, early on, and they govern a lot of the rules around safety, making sure physicians aren't impaired, making sure the practice is sound. Um, and early on, you know, seven, ten years ago, I think a lot of the boards really weren't sure. They, they understood that there were ways that we take care of patients different than technologic solutions. Doctors have been covering for other doctors telephonically forever. And to Judd's point, you know, I don't think the word telehealth or telemedicine is really going to be viewed as a separate entity in the future. It's going to be just how we practice medicine. It still currently is. I mean, today there are doctors who are speaking to patients by phone that they haven't met before, and now we've got a better way to do it. We've got video solutions and mobile applications and electronic records that are being exchanged and electronic prescriptions um, and education tools. So, you know, there's tremendous uh, advances in technology that are, that are great. Um, so that being said, I think what happened was historically the boards were unsure about what to do, and now they have embraced that, you know, the technology is advanced. We have major academic centers behind it. We have multiple private companies and public companies that are using telehealth with great outcomes, and that gives them a lot of comfort. So regulations have improved. Again, as I stated earlier, 21 of States in the last 18 months of positive regulations. There's only a few pockets where there are some regulatory activity. Uh, I think our, I know there's a question about Texas. I think our issues in Texas are well chronicled, um, but we're working closely there to come up with again, good solutions where everybody's comfortable. We are active in Texas as well. Um, I think Arkansas will be another state that will likely look at uh, modifying some of its guidelines uh, to promote practice because. Uh, we think it's unfortunate if this service is not being provided, then you're really depriving the population that has limited access to care. And it's not just rural areas. These are urban areas that can't reach their, their doctors. So overall positive. I think there's some, there was a question around um, licensure, still state-specific. There is some movement afoot about how do you establish a national licensure, which you know, obviously we support and we think it makes a lot of sense. I mean, why is virtual care different in Arizona than it is in California? Um, you know, intuitively that doesn't necessarily make sense. Uh, however, uh, you know, the, the past hadn't contemplated these kind of models. So 
positive overall, more to come, and um, I wish I could tell you more than that right now, but overall quite good. Thank you, Alan. And last question before we have to wrap up. Do you see telehealth replacing brick and mortar? Tom, would you like to take the lead? Well, uh, I, I have to say the answer is yes. I mean, I think that uh, the whole point is that uh, once you weave in these virtual channels, uh, you, you, can, you can do things through telehealth that, uh, that previously you had to use brick and mortar. Now, does that mean that we're going to see a, uh, a, a shrinking of, of the brick and mortar? I don't necessarily believe that's the case. Uh, I think that uh, what it really primarily does, and I think Alan hit on this earlier, is it, uh, it adds opportunity for growth. So it allows you to envision new products, new services, new ways to, uh, to drive value through care delivery that didn't exist previously. So I know there's uh, challenges with how much is spent on health uh, at a national level, but once again, if you can create value uh, for consumers, for enterprises that, that really matter, then it's worth, uh, it's worth investing in, in those sources of value. So uh, I'd say I, I do see it's, it's replacing some brick and mortar, but I don't know that that's necessarily going to lead to a shrinking of uh, brick and mortar resources across the country. Thank you, Tom. Well, we're just about out of time. If your question did not get answered, we will make sure to follow up with you after the webinar. I'd like to thank our panelists and the audience for joining us today. This now concludes the webinar presentation.